has it started now. It may have started. I feel like when, when this dark screen is, is it like recording now when this dark screen pops up? Okay, now it's definitely recording. Uh, most of what we know, or believe we know, about the early moments of the universe is thanks to an idea called inflation theory, first propounded in 1979 by a junior particle theorist, sorry, a junior particle physicist, then at Stanford, now at MIT, named Alan Guth. <clears throat> he was 32 years old, and by his own admission, had never done anything much more. He would probably never have had his great theory except that he happened to attend a lecture on the Big Bang given by none other than Robert Dick. Robert Dick. Dicky. Robert Dicky? Probably Dicky. Uh, it's Dick with an E. Probably Dicky. The lecture inspired Guth to take an interest in cosmology, and in particular, the birth of the universe. The eventual result was inflation theory which holds that a fraction of a moment after the dawn of creation, the universe underwent a sudden dramatic expansion. It inflated, in effect, ran away with itself, doubling in size every 10 to the negative 34th power seconds. Uh, right? Basically every tiniest, tiniest possible fraction of a second. Um, and just to be a little bit careful here, I will, um, uh, not careful, but just to, just to make sure everybody's paying attention to the sound of my beautiful voice, we'll shut the music off. There we go. Nice. Mm, I'm going start. Alright. Um, the whole episode may have lasted no more than 10 to the negative 30th power seconds. That's 1 million 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 millionths, millionths of a second. Actually, I'm not sure if I read the right amount of millions, so let me, let me get that correct. That's 1 million 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 million, 4 millionths, millionths of a second. But it changed the universe from something you could hold in your hand to something at least 10, uh, what would this be? Million, billion, trillion, quadrillion, quintillion, sextillion, septillion, I think like 10 septillion times bigger. Inflation theory explains the ripples and eddies that make our universe possible. Without it, um, uh, without it, without inflation theory, um, oh, don't get distracted. Without inflation theory, what would it be like? Without it, we, um, we would be no, there would be no clumps of matter. Uh, yeah. Without inflation theory, there would be no, no clumps of matter, right? Um, and um, what was I saying? Yeah, that's not a bad strategy. All right. Um, Without inflation theory, there'd be there'd be no clumps of matter, and um, and thus no stars, just drifting gas and everlasting darkness. Um, according to Guth's theory, at one ten millionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second, gravity emerged. Um, after another ludicrously uh, brief interval, it was joined by electromagnetism and the strong and weak nuclear forces, the stuff of physics, 
Uh, those were those were joined an instant later by swarms of elemental particles, the stuff of stuff. From nothing at all, suddenly there were swarms of photons, protons, electrons, neutrons, and much else, between 10 to the 79th power and 10 to the 89th power of each, according to the standard Big Bang Theory. I messed up one of the sentences. It was, it was supposed to say, after another ludicrously brief interval, it was joined by electromagnetism and the strong and weak nuclear forces, the stuff of physics. Man, I think I, I, I made it sound like a run-on sentence, but that was the end of the sentence. I think you got it. Such quantities are, of course, ungraspable. It is enough to know that in a single cracking instant, we were endowed with a universe that was vast, at least 100 billion light years across, according to the theory, but possibly any size up to infinite and perfectly arrayed for the creation of stars, galaxies, and other complex systems. What is extraordinary, from our point of view, is how well it turned out for us. If the universe had formed just a tiny bit differently, uh, if gravity were fractionally stronger or weaker, if the expansion had proceeded just a little more slowly or swiftly, then there might never have been the stable elements to make you and me and the ground we stand on. I think he said something like this already in the introduction. Had gravity been a trifle stronger, the universe itself might have collapsed like a badly erected tent without precisely the right values to give it the right dimensions and density and component parts. Had it been weaker, however, nothing would have coalesced. The universe would have remained forever a dull, scattered void. This is one reason that some experts believe there may have been many other Big Bangs, perhaps trillions and trillions of them, spread through the mighty span of eternity, and that the reason we exist in this particular one is that this is the one we, we could exist in. As Edward P. Tryon of Columbia University once put it, in answer to the question of why it happened, I offer the modest proposal that our universe is simply one of those things which happen from time to time. To which adds Guth, although the creation of a universe might be very unlikely, Tryon emphasized that no one had counted the failed attempts. Martin Rees, uh, Britain's Astronomer Royale, believes that there are many universes, possibly an infinite number, each with different attributes and different combinations, and that we simply live in one that combines things in the way that allows us to exist. He makes an analogy with a very large clothing star, store. If there is a large stock of clothing, <coughs> you're not surprised to find a suit that fits. If there are many universes, each governed by a differing set of numbers, there will be one where there is a particular set of numbers suitable to life. We are in that one. All right, fair enough. Reese maintains that six numbers in particular govern our universe, and that if any of these values were changed, even very slightly, things would not be as they are. For example, for the universe to exist as it does requires that hydrogen be converted to helium in a pre precise but <coughs> um, what is that? in a precise but comparatively stately manner specifically in a way that converts seven one thousandths synths of its mass to energy. Lower that value very slightly from 0.007% to 0.006%, say, and no transformation could take place. The universe would consist of hydrogen and nothing else. Raise the value very slightly to the 0.008% bonding, uh, and bonding would be so wildly prolific that the hydrogen would long since have been exhausted. In either case, with the slightest tweaking of the numbers, the universe as we know and need it would not be here. End of uh, section. I should say that everything is just right so far. In the long term, gravity may turn out to be a little too strong, and one day it may halt the expansion of the universe and bring it collapsing in upon itself till it crushes itself down into another singularity possibly to start the whole process over again. On the other hand, it may be too weak, and the universe will keep racing away forever. 
until everything is so far apart that there is no chance of material interactions so that the universe becomes a place that is inert and dead but very roomy. The third option is that gravity is just right. Critical density is the cosmologist's, it's a cosmologist's term for it and <clears throat> that it will hold the universe together at the right dimensions to allow things to go on indefinitely. Cosmologists in their lighter moments sometimes call this the Goldilocks effect that everything is just right. For the record, these three possible universes are known respectively as closed, open, and flat. Now the question has occurred to all of us at some point. Now the question, sorry, the question that has occurred to all of us at some point is, what would happen if you traveled out to the edge of the universe and, as it were, put your head through the curtains? What would your head be if it were no longer in the universe? What would you find? The answer, disappointingly, is that you can never get to the edge of the universe. That's not because it would take too long to get there, though of course it would, but because even if you traveled outward, and outward in a straight line, indefinitely, and pugnaciously, you would never arrive at an outer boundary. Instead, you would come back to where you began, at which point, presumably, you would rather lose heart in the exercise and give up. The reason for this is that the universe bends in a way that we, cannot, we can't adequately imagine in conformance with Einstein's theory of relativity, which we will get to in due course. For the moment, it is enough to know that we are not adrift in some large, ever-expanding bubble. Rather, space curves in a way that allows it to be boundless but infinite. Space cannot even properly be said to be expanding. Because as the physicist and Nobel laureate Steven Weinberg notes, solar systems and galaxies are not expanding, and space itself is not expanding. Rather, the galaxies are rushing apart. It is all something of a challenge to intuition. Or as the biologist J.B.S. Haldane once famously observed, the universe is not only queerer than we suppose, it is queerer than we can suppose. The analogy that is usually given for explaining the curvature of space is to imagine someone uh, from a universe of flat universes, of flat surfaces, who had never seen a sphere being brought to Earth. No matter how far he roamed across the planet's um, surface, he would never find an edge. He might eventually return to the spot where he had started, uh, and would of course be utterly confounded to explain how that had happened. Well, we are in the same position, in space as our puzzled flatlander, only we, only we are flummoxed by a higher dis dimension. Just as there is no place where you can find the edge of the universe, so there is no place where you can stand at the center and say, this is where it all began, this is the centermost point of it all. We are all at the center of it all. Actually, we don't know that for sure, we can't prove it mathematically. Scientists just assume that we can't really be the center of the universe. Think what that would imply, but that the phenomenon must be the same for all observers in all places. Still, we don't actually know. For us, the universe goes only as far as light has traveled in the billions of years uh, since the universe was formed. This visible universe, the universe we know and can talk about, is a million, 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 that's, um, million, billion, trillion, quadrillion, quintillion, uh, septillion, sextillion, one sextillion miles across, but, uh, I think more or less. But according to most theories, the universe, um, uh, at large, the meta-universe, as it is sometimes called, is vastly roomier still. According to Rees, the number of light years to the edge of it, of this larger, unseen universe, would be written not with ten zeros, not even with a hundred, but with millions. In short, there's more space than you can imagine already, without going to the trouble of trying to envision some additional beyond. For a long time, the Big Bang Theory had one gaping hole that troubled a lot of people. Namely, that it couldn't begin to explain how we got here, 
Although 98% of all matter that exists was created with the Big Bang, that matter um, consisted exclusively of light gases. The helium, the hydrogen, the lithium that we mentioned earlier. Uh, not only was... Uh, what was I saying? Not only was... Um, Am I ahead? Not anymore. Not, not um. What was I saying? Oh, oops. Not only was. Can't remember where I was. Um, yeah, I made it. What was I saying? Created with the big man. Helium, hydrogen, and lithium that we mentioned earlier. Now, one particle of the heavy stuff was so vital to our being, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and all the rest emerged from the gaseous brew of creation. But, and here's the troubling part, to force these heavy elements you need the kind of heat and energy of a big bang. Yet, there has been only one big bang and it didn't produce them. So where did they come from? Interestingly, the man who found the answer to that question was a cosmologist who heartily despised the big bang theory, the big bang as a theory, and coined the term big bang sarcastically as a way of mocking it. We'll get to him shortly, but before we turn to the question of how we got here, it might be worth taking a few minutes to consider just exactly where here is. Alright, and um, that's the end of the chapter. Oops. Pretty interesting stuff. I don't think I stand a chance here. So, you guys enjoyed that. Um, Nice. <sighs> See, so yeah, my father recommended I I read that book, and um, yeah, it's been it's been uh, interesting interesting read so far. Finished the first chapter now. Um, it's a real. Um, mind-boggling idea the Big Bang it's a lot <laughs> very spectacular it's the uh, the religion of science almost I don't feel like I'll ever fully understand how we can know all this stuff.
How do we know, you know? This is a pretty good strategy. Getting hit by hammers like really throws really throws off your pursuers. <laughs> it's like you get a hammer and they're like, I almost had him and the hammer hit him if he went flying. Did not lose that tail one time. I like to think of the the. I know it's not very scientific, but I, I like to think of the the unlikeliness of our existence as some kind of uh, evidence, like circumstantial, strong circumstantial evidence that maybe there's some kind of intelligence out there that wanted us to be here, you know? Maybe, maybe not exerting any kind of control over us um, and not, not interacting with us, you know? But just out there watching us, maybe, uh, you know. Uh, I mean, I don't know why that would be appealing to me. I mean, I guess we'd be, we'd be sort of important in some way. Maybe it's not so much an appealing concept. Just it's just it's just appealing to me as a theory, not so much because because it's a nice theory, but because I like the idea that I could figure it out, you know. Walls are closing and I panic. Look, I was one of the last survivors, I think, wasn't I? Oh, I wasn't, wa wait, no, I was not the winner. I'm just looking at some, looking at whoever was the winner. GMG, but I must have been one of the last ones, because as soon as I, as soon as I lost, I didn't get to watch. <sighs> just panic there at the end. But I made it to the end, I made it to the final. I was one of the, one of the, one of the last, last, uh, Last man standing, last last guy standing, I can say. Not bad. And I spent some time reading my book, bettering myself. Feel pretty good about it. New reward, the poser bean. Okay. It's a win. We got some kudos. That's a lot of crowns. Oh, there we go.
that's all folks see you next time